This video is brought to you by Viking Jewelry. What is the history of the Viking shield? How was it made? How was it used? Where did it come from? as the deeds of men who once were echo through the centuries. A faint image appears, a fading memory of a dream. An object tells us a story, its appearance, shape, and covers an idea. A design shrines an intention. Minds of the past, voices of those who can speak no more. Shadows that lurk beyond what is known, a feeble grasp on a figment of truth, like layers of eternity. Behold, the past awakens. Hello noble ones, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking and today we're looking at this absolutely gorgeous, historically accurate Viking shield. This was made by Scutae Borealis, it was a fantastic collaboration with this craftsman. But if you're interested in having a historically accurate shield just like this one, or perhaps similar to this one but still made according to your own specification, feel free to contact Scutae Borealis, you'll find a link in the description below. Tell them that the Metatron sent you, they will look out for the noble ones. I strongly recommend you to check him out, he comes with a full recommendation of the Metatron's channel. But to the real questions now, how was this shield made? What is it made of and how do we justify every single choice archaeologically? First, the shield is 80 centimeters in diameter. The boards were made out of 8mm coniferous planks joined together with hide glue, forming a circle. When it comes to the wood species, Norse shields were typically made of coniferous wood, at least when it comes to these examples, and occasionally oak, just these. When it comes to the thickness, the base thickness of the well-preserved boards coming from these two locations is 8mm, precisely. Now when it comes to the glue that Scutae Borealis used, Unfortunately, there are no surviving residues of glue on Viking Age shields. So two possibilities known from neighboring periods are hide glue, which is made from boiled animal skins and bones, and cheese glue, which is made from the casein proteins in milk. Cheese glue is more resistant to moisture, but for this case, we decided to go for hide glue. The 80 centimeters in diameter was my personal request. The historical range of Viking Age round shields appears to be from 70 centimeters to 100 centimeters, respectively. This includes regionally specific examples such as those from Eastern Scandinavia and the Northwest British Isles, which can be much smaller. The weight of the completed shield excluding the strap is 2.9 kilograms. The total edge thickness is 6 millimeters excluding the clamps and including the clamps goes up to 10 millimeters. Both of those edge dimensions are exactly 1 millimeter less than the Burka BJ850 fragments, which was faced on both sides with 1 millimeter leather rather than just on the front. So the tapering is perfect. The weight is well within the range of historical examples. Breaking the fourth wall for a moment, here I am editing the video, but I'd like to say a lot of deeply researched information to be shared with you in a moment from now, but one of the reasons why we could do so much research and take so much time to make this video is because of the sponsor that made this video possible, Viking Jewelry. Now, the guys at Viking Jewelry have been sponsoring my channel for a while now, so I'll always be thankful, but now it's Black Friday, which means that you've got a 60% off a variety of items on their store. Now, on top of that, because you are the noble ones, you also get an extra 10%, so you can go up to 70% off by using my code METATRON10. 
but it's only valid for the next 48 hours. Now you know that I'm absolutely in love with the rings that they provide. If you ever follow me on any of my other social media platforms, such as my IG or Facebook page, you know that I always wear my rings from Viking Jewelry. This is not just because it's sponsored, I freaking love them my wife be my witness. So if you do decide to get one of the shields from Scutae Borealis, you can pair it with a bronze or silver ring from Viking Jewelry. And they've also got some amazing t-shirts, such as this one representing the, let's try and use Old Norse pronunciation, Yggdrasil. Again, 70% off just for the next 48 hours. Click the link in the description below. And big thanks to Viking Jewelry for sponsoring my video. The board was tapered asymmetrically, starting with a gentle taper on both sides at about 6 cm from the edge, all the way to a more aggressive taper on the front side, only at about 2 cm from the edge. The final edge thickness of the board is 3 to 4 mm. Logically, since most of our circle's surface area is situated towards the edges, even just tapering the outermost few centimeters of a shield had a significant effect on how it feels. As part of their own shield project, the Society for Combat Archaeology closely examined the were preserved boards from Gokstad to determine how they were tapered. This is the best information available about the tapering of the Viking Age shield, so I will leave a link in the description. This shield was faced with hide. When filled with hide, especially if it's an untanned raw hide, there is a danger of the board warping because the hide's faces expand and contract with heat and moisture. He takes the following steps to ensure that shields doesn't warp. He glued the face on without soaking it first. This causes a lot of air bubbles, but they're much easier to deal with than a major warp. After the glue has partially dried, he rubbed hot water into the air bubbles and scraped them down with a pallet knife. In this specific case, I was told that this took about an hour. However, this method only works with hide glue because it reopens with heat. After everything had dried, Ben cut the excess hide from the edges and a handhold. The handhold is 11.5 centimeters wide, which is within the average range of Viking Age shield bosses internal diameters. When compared to most modern shield reproductions, you will notice that they will tend to have bigger handhold, but that is not the case when it comes to real Viking Age shields. This is probably because a lot of reenactors these days wear anachronistic leather gloves which are rather big and prevent them from being able to hold authentic shields properly. Therefore, the demand caused blacksmiths to make bosses bigger than the real ones, which in turn shifted the general perception of how big real Viking Age bosses handholds where the average inner space of Viking Age shield bosses is between 10.5 to 11.5 centimeters. Norse shields are usually, if not always, faced with hide. So whenever we see in any sort of reproduction, whether it be gaming, movies and LARP, shields with exposed blanks, we can safely say that those are not accurate. Linen is popular in modern reproductions because it's cheap, but the only evidence for textile facings on Viking Age shields come from a Norse shield which was buried in Cumwhitton, England. The shield had fragments of textile under the boss flange, but these fragments could easily be remains of some kind of padding inside the handhold. Regardless of whether or not this one find was originally faced with textile, there are at least seven Viking shields with preserved hide facings. Therefore, our choice. Again, the Society for Combat Archaeology examined the hide remains on four shields from antiquity to the early medieval period. Two of the shields examined were found to have been faced with tanned hide, including a Viking Age shield from Berka. The other two shields were found to have been faced with untanned hide, including a Viking Age from Tira, Latvia. When historical accuracy is your focus, then probably the best option would be a single color pattern. The reason being that any design involves a lot of speculation. Many modern reproduction have painted designs based on depictions of shields in period iconography. However, most objects in early medieval iconography are very fibrally depicted at a much lower level of detail than they were in real life. And we don't know if that was also the case with shields. Archaeologically, the only confirmed fragment of a Norse shield with a readable painted design is from this location in the Isle of Man. There are also fragments of painted boards from Grimstrup, Denmark. Neither of these fragments are large enough to show what the original layout was. This shield was specifically painted with this pattern, a blue and white flared cross. This was my personal request, and is based on depictions of shield in Anglo-Saxon and Frankish manuscripts. To achieve the white, lime was used, but because lime is prone to flaking, it was used together with egg white as a binding medium. It took many thin layers to build up the color. 
For the blue, Ben used a mixture of lime and woad. Blue was a difficult colour to produce in the Viking Age, and woad, in this form, would have been particularly expensive. So this could be a little bit of a high-end shield, if you will. Other methods of achieving blue paint could be by using this. The Grimstop fragments included blue paint, which appears to have been achieved with woad, but we are not aware of any analysis of the pigment remains. This time, a whole egg and linseed oil were the binding medium. More information on Viking Age pigment down in the description. The shield was already faced on the front with rawhide. However, to be consistent with the iconography, it has an additional thicker hide rim attached with iron edge clamps. There are hundreds of finds of edge clamps on tens of shields. Some are made of iron, some are made of copper, others are tinned, and one is gilded. A very well-preserved fragment from Berka BJ850 shows remains of its hide edge, tanned cowhide, held in place by a copper alloy edge clamp. Fragment is also faced on both sides with tanned sheepskin. No stitching or holes for stitches. It appears that the clamps were used to keep the edge in place. In other words, stitching around the entirety of the circumference is possible, but not in combination with clamps, one or the other. The beginning process started with two reels of one to two millimeters thick and tanned hide. The reels were then soaked in water, cut and stitched together to form a loop 15 to 20 centimeters less than the circumference of the shield. The loop was then stretched around the edge of the shield board. When rawhide is saturated with water, it stretches easily, and as it dries, it shrinks and forms itself to the edge of the shield. Once dry, the hide had formed to the edge of the shield nicely, and it is so tight that you couldn't pull it off with your fingers. Perhaps for the next shield that I will commission them, we'll go for pure copper. The clamps were cut from sheet metal, hammered and bent around the shield rim. Two small iron nails are hammered through each clamp from the front, cut and peened at the back. Most Viking Age shields found in Scandinavia don't have any edge clamps, but of the shields that do, the number of edge clamps ranged between 1 to 54, with the most common being 1 to 10. In Frankish iconography, the number of edge clamps on shields often matches the radial pattern of the shield's face. Since the shield has a simple radially symmetric cross painted on the front, we decided to attach 8 edge clamps to match. The basic shape of the handle was roughed out of a piece of beech wood. It's D-shaped in cross-section, 25mm wide in the middle, and as you can see, it slightly tapers towards the terminals, which are 21mm wide. A simple ornament was carved in the middle, inspired by the carving of the Trelleborg shield's grip. Almost all preserved grips on Norse shields from the Viking Age had some level of decorations on them, ranging from filed lines hatching to intricate embossing and cast terminals. However, most preserved handles were expensive pieces with metal shell, and the Trelleborg shield is the only find with a completely wooden handle, well preserved enough to be able to tell whether or not it was decorated. The handle was then oiled with linseed, giving it a really nice orange colour, which contrasts with the yellow pine boards. The handle of the Trelleborg shield was also beech. Forged iron nails were used to attach the boss and handle to the board. Holes are drilled through the board and handle, slightly smaller than the width of the nail's shank, 4mm, so they are held in place with friction. The tip of the nail shank is bent with pliers at a right angle. The hole should not be deeper than the tip of the nail, so it still digs into the wood. The boss in this case is a Type R563, which was my personal request, as it's my favourite. This type was common in Scandinavia from the mid-10th century onwards, which already helps us to place this shield in time. R563 bosses are shallow compared to the earlier types, and are dome or mushroom-shaped. This specific boss is 16.5 centimetres wide, including the flange which is slightly above average, but still very well within the historical range of 12 to 17.8 centimeters for Scandinavian shield bosses. The strap was attached using leather toggles, which were threaded from the front through 10 millimeters holes drilled in the shield board and tied to the strap at the back of the shield. The size and positions of these holes are based on the two holes that were drilled in the Trelleborg shield. Judging by the position, it's likely that they were used to attach a strap. One of the high medieval shields from Marburg had a strap attached in a similar way through similar holes, but instead of purely leather toggles, it had small cylindrical pieces of wood wrapped in leather. There is no extant evidence of wooden toggles like this in the Viking Age, so instead Ben used simple leather toggle, which were a known technology that we can back up. 
Many of you might have this question. What about shield rims made entirely of iron instead of rawhide? Well, shields with metal edges were extremely uncommon in the Viking Age and the most relevant finds come from wealthy graves which each contained multiple elaborately decorated shields. One of the two shields from a grave in Ness, Norway, had a decorated copper alloy sheet along the edge of the shield, held in place by copper alloy edge clamps. At least two shields from Burka graves, BJ736 and BJ628 Sweden, but one of the shields from BJ736 had 54 clamps which covered the entire circumference. Iron fragments from Laxa Tomb 7, Gotland, and this grave, Sweden, both appear to have formed part of a shield circumference, and in the case of Laxa, it was held in place by six iron clamps. Both of these shields are unusually small, 44 to 50 centimeters each, compared to most Norse shields, and are probably region-specific. Related Germanic shields from the centuries preceding the Viking Age include the Kingly Shield from Saturn Who Mount 1, in England, 7th century. It had a rim consisting of copper strips held in place with edge clamps. And another example of an expensive shield from the Banagat Grave 11, Denmark, 3rd, 4th century, had a rim consisting of continuous copper strips. Now, is there evidence for rawhide shield rims being nailed all the way around rather than stitched? Well, there is no evidence for shield rims being attached this way. If it was done, at least one of the thousands of Viking Age shield remains found throughout Scandinavia would have fragments of nails around the rim. There is no such evidence. It appears that when a warrior had enough money to put superfluous metal around the rim of a shield, he would be more likely to do so in the form of edge clamps, which have some practical use and make a better display of his wealth. Okay, but this sort of finishes up this video and the information that we have gathered for you this time. Most of the information was given to me by Benjamin, who is the producer at Scutae Borealis. And so big thanks to him and big thanks to Viking Jewelry again for sponsoring this video. I hope you enjoyed it, Noble Ones. After my usual closing, I will add a little musical extra with some footage just for your enjoyment. All right, number ones. Well, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please remember thumbs up. And if you're not yet members of this community, become a number one. Subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. Thank you very much for watching. And remember, the Metatron has spread its wings. Goodbye. Thank mm -hmm. you.